Hi friend, Niklas here from Your Audio Solutions. I hope you are doing well. Welcome to this week's show. On the show today, we have the multi-instrumentalist Mo Pleasure, and he has played with artists such as Ray Charles, George Duke, Michael Jackson, Earth, Wind & Fire, Beth Midler, and many, many others. I actually met Mo a few years ago when I was working for producer and engineer John Moon, uh, and it was his project that never got released, unfortunately, but they had hired all these amazing musicians, and Mo was one of them. And it was incredible, all, all, the, all these incredible musicians. Uh, and just turning out in industry was awesome. Walking into the studio and just hearing these incredible people play incredibly, you know, it's uh, awesome when you get to be a part of those sessions. Uh, but anyhow, that's when I first met Mo. It was awesome talking to him again. And I think you will love this interview as well. But before we get into the interview, it would be awesome if you can join what I call the audio tribe. Uh, it's free to join. You just click the link in the description below and you have joined the audio tribe. And if you join the audio tribe, uh, audio tribe, sorry, you get access, exclusive access to interviews before the public. You also get exclusive um, Q and A's and live streams that I'm trying out. So. It'd be awesome if you want to join uh, to get access to all this fun stuff. And again, it's completely free. Just click the link, enter your name and email address, and you are, and you have joined the Audio Tribe. So I hope to see you there. Uh, but that's it. Let's get into the interview with Mo Pleasure. Mo, well, awesome. You know, awesome to have you here. Pleasure Great talking to, be here, to you. Pleasure. Uh, and as we just said, reunited after five years. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I love John Moon. I really miss him. I love working with him. Yeah, they're awesome, man. Yes. Uh, he, he's an awesome producer, engineer, he for really sure. Um, so, Mo, I'd like to start out this conversation interview with a... Um, it was a quote I heard from George uh, Duke. Uh, it was oh, a clip, clip you posted on Facebook some weeks ago. Uh, and he says something, I'm just paraphrasing, uh, but he, says, he said something like uh, that you, Mo, he was so good that I convinced him to come to LA, that you can work in LA, and now he's MD for Earth, Wind & Fire. Uh, I know it was a while ago, but just uh, wondering if you can remember, you know, what that first audition was like. Like, how did you prepare for it? How did you kill it? Because obviously you impressed George, so you did something right. <laughs> I tell you what, George is, um, first of all, he's he's like a musical dad, musical father to me, and very gracious. So um, I'm, he's actually part of, a big part of the reason that I got the Earth, Wind & Fire gig, because right. he had spoken to Philip Bailey. Um, Philip said they were going to reform. Uh, this is back in 1994, um, and they were looking for a keyboardist, and um, he recommended me. Hmm. So... It was one, th one of those things, like George Duke's um, home and his, his office and studio were in his home, and it was almost like uh, part of the heartbeat of Los Angeles music scene, right. because you could go there and you might get a gig or something just being at his house, because the phone would ring, it might be the Tonight Show or some uh, you know artist that's going, Janet Jackson, it could be anybody, and um, he, they, his recommendation was worth gold. So the truth of it is, I was pretty much walked in by George Duke's recommendation. Right. That's yep. not bad. Not <laughs> bad at all. Not bad at all. <laughs> That's a good reference. And just thank yeah. God, they actually did like my playing and, and all that. So I ended up staying for almost 10 years with yeah, Earth, Wind yeah. & Fire. Yeah. I mean, because you didn't start out as an MD, I guess. You you right. you, you got that position a few years in. But yes. something that's really fascinating is like, for you being an MD for a band like Earth, Wind & Fire, because obviously you're coming in to to be an MD for their music. Uh, right. So how, actually, what's your responsibility when you get that position? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess that's my question. Well, you know, I mean, obviously those guys had already been, you know, playing their own music for, I don't know, 30 years or something by the time I got there. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, they always looking for ways to refresh it and also put new shows together, do something that people had never seen before. Um, so it was, um, you know, I had a multiple, a bunch of jobs, you know, first of all, I was putting together the shows. So it would be like myself and Philip Bailey and, um, you know, at times others from the band and stuff would get together and plot out like, okay, this year we want to do these songs. 
Um, this is what we're thinking about as the opener. Um, so we need some music for that. You know, what's the order going to be? How can we do a different treatment on these songs? You know, because as great as the songs are, they've been playing them so long. They're like, well, maybe we could do, change the chords here, or go into something different, right, right. change up the groove, you know. So a lot of that was was my job, you know, was facilitating that new horn lines, um, stuff like that. So um, it was it was also um, important to know like what was going on as far as like uh, choreography mm. and um, lighting. Oh, so that's also so, your responsibility as an MD? Not my responsibility, but the three we have to all work in concert right, with right. each other. Otherwise, it's a mess, you know. Mm -hmm. And Earth, Wind, and Fire had to always have that. Um, unlike, say, a show show like a Michael Jackson or something like that, um, there was that element of um, you know things may change at the last minute kind of thing. So if Philip feels like he wants to do another 16 bars or give somebody a solo or we're changing songs in the middle of the show. Uh, there always had to be that kind of, you know, thing going on. So there was the responsibility of that because as you change, say Philip changes a song and it happened to me several times, like last minute, right before we walk on. Okay. We're, we're, uh, we're not doing fantasy tonight. We're doing something else or this kind of thing. Wow. Um, I had to let the light people know we had to, uh, check with choreography and make sure that, you know, the dancers were able to come out of whatever the, the previous song is and whether they had the right costumes on and all this kind of stuff. So there right. are a lot of moving parts. And especially when you do something like television or, um, you know, something that was broadcast or uh, recorded, there's I was in charge of that kind of stuff, too. So um, I'd have to let whoever, whatever sh TV show, whatever we were right, on, right. Let them know, you know, Maurice White comes out at this part, boom, this guitar solo starts, you know, right. here. Or, you know, they, they want us to do, uh, normally we our show length of a song might be, let's say it's four minutes or something, but they need us to get it down to 3.30 right. for the TV show. So I have to figure out, okay, we're going to do, you know, right after the bridge, we're going to cut right to this kind of thing, you know. Right. And, so um, do you have to um, uh, liaise with, with, with uh, whoever's in charge of the band at that time or... Everybody. And, you know, the thing is, it's a band, too, you know, Nicholas, because mm -hmm. so it's different than being the music director for Bette Midler, who sure. is another person I am D4, mm -hmm. um, because you have you have, first of all, um, d different opinions about things from, you know, got guys in the band or like, you know, um, you have to facilitate, say, the horn section. Some things are just in, are may not even be possible, you know, because uh, um, you always have to keep take into consideration like that they they're playing a whole show and they have to dance and all this kind of stuff so there's um a lot of times you had to, to kind of um massage a few things to make everybody happy you know right, right. um i mean in general philip bailey was the leader of the band at that time and he was the one that pr pretty much had the final word on things you know right. so it's Unless a case more, with the Artist is always right, or oh, definitely, yeah. artist is always right, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless they're wrong, and I'll tell them too, you know, if they're right. wrong. But the um, you know, even with that, we had Philip and Maurice, so right. uh, Maurice was not usually on the road with us, but he would come with us from now on, time to time. And when he, he'd he come in, then he was undoubtedly the leader of the band, you know, right, so right. um. Sense. It was a it was a little bit of a balancing act sometimes. So there's a certain amount of psychology that goes with it. You know, somebody's whispering one thing in your ear, and somebody else is telling you something at the same time. So you have to kind of like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, do that. But it was it was great group of you know people, and um, they're still family members. Nice, to me. nice man. But how how do you become an MD? Like, what's the how do you earn that spot? I guess. Um, <sighs> Well, you know, I actually was asked by Philip, and he just recognized certain talents I had. You know, I have perfect pitch, so I can right. go boom. That's an F major seven, or you know, this kind of thing. I, um, usually, it's a, um, it it's not always, but usually it's a keyboardist or some chord, you know, guitarist right, or right. some chordal instrument because you have like a knowledge of all the parts. Mm -hmm. You know, what the string parts are, you know, the horn parts, and you could actually sit there on your keyboard and play them. Mm. For and you know i'm i'm lucky because i also play the trumpet so i understand what it what's doable what's not what it takes lip wise to get you know to make something happen what's too much you know um for a horn player to do um and you know so um and i also understand the technology of things in terms of like you know in case we had to put something together that involved you know recording something 
or, um, you know, like an opening of a show or that kind of stuff. So, um, and I was just, you know, hopefully creative enough to come up with some new stuff. Um, you know, there was some, what one comes to mind is shining star, which is, you know, pretty much legendary. Why would you ever change anything in that song kind of thing? Right. And, um, Philip came to me like, I want to put some new chords on the, on the chorus, you know? So I was like, okay, you know, here goes, how about if I, and I just kind of <laughs> like two, five, for all you, you know, right, right. musicians out there, pattern, um, that he was like, yeah, that right there, let's do that, you know, and it stuck, and, you know, we did it, and people uh, still come to me now saying, like, yeah, I like that version too, you know, which is, which is really an honor, because I've been listening to, I've been going to Earth, Wind, and Fire concerts since I was, like, 14 years old, so, right. <laughs> yeah, I was a huge fan. That's pretty awesome, man. Um, but obviously, you've been working with a lot of artists that people know, uh, True. has it always been on a reference basis or have you ever had to audition or anything like that? I have had to audition. I hate auditions. Right. I'm terrible <laughs> at them. I'm not good at auditions. Um, How come? I just, um, nervous, yeah. nerves. Um, you know, it's, it's when you do this stuff for a living, it's, it's a whole thing to it because, you know, it's kind of like you get the gig and you'll be eating for another, for a whole year. You know what I mean? You'll get the, you, there's your, your money. You, you sure. don't get the gig and, um, you can take it, really take it to heart. Like, wow, well, why wasn't I good enough? And all this kind of stuff, you know, and I'm a pretty sensitive guy. So I'm, you know, those things affect me. Right. Um, right. of course. But yeah, there's been auditions that I didn't get. And sometimes it wasn't even my fault. Um, but in general, it's been word of mouth. Like right. people knew, especially after I've been in the business a few years, sure. um, people knew if they got me, they know what they're getting kind of thing. So yeah. I would just get calls, you know. But what are some of the things that could make an audition not work out? Is it because you don't, you play the wrong note or is it other things? Yeah. And, you know, I got to tell you, Nicholas, I saw that kind of stuff change, you know, because if it's something like, say, Earth, Wind & Fire or um, even, say, Michael Jackson... I think they would, uh, and I did not have to audition for Michael, So, but right, right. Um, they did have auditions. Um, I think a lot of times it's kind of like, what is the vibe among the band? So it's like, if you're auditioning or you're at that level of audition where um, they kind of picked most of the band members or something, they, it's one of those, it's just like one of those um, things that you can't describe it's like it just clicks you know this this person it might even be about their personality or the look or this kind of thing you know mm. so there are a lot of things that and i've actually had to run auditions you know for like bet bet midler where we picked the whole band and right. you know this kind of thing and they had the, all the horn players had to dance and they had to double on instruments so right. you know the sax player to play flute and clarinet and all this kind of stuff so um it's different things but um in general i think the best I try to just be myself at auditions and it's kind of like if they're looking for that, they, they'll hire me. You know, they might, they might love my playing and just not like the way I look. It's just nothing I can do about it. Right, there have been right. a few auditions that had uh, video cameras so that the, you know, the artist right. who may not even be there could see, you know, what kind of band she wanted to put together or he wanted to put together and right. that kind of thing. Makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who, let's say you are doing the auditions? Sure. Uh, what is the most important thing an artist or musician should get right coming into an audition? I'd say definitely know the music, you know, know the music and know mm -hmm. what your parts are in it. And like, say, if you're a keyboard player um, and you're auditioning for, say, second keyboards or something, mm -hmm. know the first part too. Right. You know, if you're a guitarist, know all the parts. So if you had to switch, you could just go, oh, yeah, I know that part, you know. Right. And that makes you, uh, um, I would say also, um, maybe do some research on the artist if you haven't already. Mm. So, um, you know, like know what their songs are, certainly. Um, maybe watch some live um, things. You know, now it's so easy with, you know, YouTube and everything. Mm. Watch some live shows and see what it is that they like, what the last guy did or that kind of thing. So, um, you know that right there, that's a real important spot. I got to make sure I play that line right there, yeah. you know. Or obviously she hates these or he hates these particular sounds on the keyboard so i'm staying away from those right right you know? and um and you know it's a weird thing because you have to kind of be humble and bold at the same time you gotta um the, the funny part to me is that all the gigs that i got by audition I, I walked out going like i didn't get it every time i walked out like that that's when i got the gig 
you know. Right. <laughs> so it's it's when I when I go in there all confident. That's when I never. <laughs> <get it. laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, but obviously, playing with all these bands and playing long shows, um, what's your approach to memorizing a whole uh, set of songs? Do you have do you have notations with you, or how how does that? It depends how on how much time I have. You know, like. Um, in general, I, my, my memory is really good. I play classical music, so I have to, I have to memorize like concertos and stuff right, like right, that. Right. You know? So I'm pretty, you know, if I have enough time, and it takes time. I mean, it's literally, um, the problem comes when you're like doing it the night before or something like that, because you can only cram so much stuff in your head. Sure. But I have to do that a lot too. So I'll make cheat sheets, like um, this particular hard part, you know, my own little scrawled um, um, you know, music paper thing or whatever. I've got um, those kind of things, maybe tape them to my keyboard, tape them to the floor, or whatever right, right. it takes, you know, back mm -hmm. of my bass. Or, um, so I will do that kind of thing as well if I need to. But in general, the best thing is to have, you know, a certain amount of time, depending on what the workload is, um, right. to memorize. And then how much time do you have once you get in rehearsal? It might be a thing where it's like, okay, we're, we got a, one rehearsal and we're, you know, next day is the show. Hmm. Or it might be something like we got a month of rehearsals, you know. So um, certainly that's enough time to memorize something so you, you have a little bit more leeway. Right, right, right. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and let's say you, you do have notations, but you do find yourself in the moment like, oh, shit, what's coming yeah. next? And you yeah. you can't for reason see it in your notes. How do you deal with those? Because they're quite stressful, I can imagine. Oh, it's, I can tell you, you just made me think about uh, five different stories I could tell you, you know. Yeah, I mean, sure, like, I'll tell you one. Um, I was playing with Boys to Men. Right, um, right, cool. And we, I, I didn't, you know, I was subbing on the gig, or as you say, depping over mm -hmm. here on the gig. So it wasn't some, uh, something I've been playing, you know, very often. It's my first time, you know. And their songs were like a lot of baby face songs. You know, we know them all. Right. Um, but they have like piano intros that are very specific, this kind of thing and all that. But there are like so many similarities from song to song hmm. um, because, you know, the same guy wrote them. You right, know? Right, right. <laughs> so um, I, we're coming, we're finishing one song and we're on a, on a stage in front of, I'm telling you, it was probably like 20,000 people or something and outside and i cannot remember the intro i'm looking at the set list and I, i'm like what song was that because that's the other thing you don't you may even memorize the song but you may not remember what it's called what the name of it is when you you know mm -hmm. if you don't if you're not doing it every day and i'm like so what song is that you know and i couldn't and hit we're coming to the end of the last song and i know i have to start the next song and i just looked behind me and i saw the road manager that had been with them for a long time and i was like hey Come here, come here, come here, come here. I go, sing me the beginning of uh, of the next tune, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And literally, uh, he sang he sang a couple notes, and boom, it just came to me like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, it, I was like right on the mark. <laughs> on the mark thank God. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's good, man. I mean, I haven't been in, 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 in that situation, but I, I, I played shows uh, for yes. um, uh, cover bands, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, and songs like notes have literally dropped out of my head and it's been like sure fuck sure i don't know what i'm gonna do you know yeah we uh, always have those moments you know even after playing a show over and over and over um well you just have those we call them you know brain freezes or brain farts yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. like it's just gonna happen um and you know they don't always come out so great <laughs> yeah. but uh you know so far so good good man <laughs> yeah um but so going back to George, uh, George Duke again, like, yes. w was that your first uh, gig in the industry or who was the first guy? Well, uh, first was Ray Charles. Yes, that was the name. Yep. It dropped out of my head. First I got a brain freeze as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was 1986. Yeah. Um, I was a you know, bass player for him. So yep. how, how did you get the gig with, with the Ray Charles then? What was the, um, mm -hmm. what was the story behind that? Well, Nicholas, I was... Um, I was in college in, in Connecticut, so I was um, actually I had I wasn't even in my last year of college. I was in my, you know I had a year and a half to go, mm. and I went to a concert at our at our university that was Ray Char Ray Charles played. So right. afterwards, I went backstage, um, just kind of being you know muso, kind of like hanging around the guys and 
seeing if I get an autograph, that kind of thing, you know. And one of the um, one of the members of the band asked me if, if I knew where he could get something to drink. So I ended up taking them to the local pub and uh, talking to him about, hey, how do I, you know, how do you get a gig like this? And so I'm still in college, you know, a music student. Mm-hmm. And um, he he tells me, he goes, well, you know, there's there's going to be a vacancy in the bass seat pretty soon so um send the tape to this address right so i did i went to a studio and i did a little demo tape and sent it out there and uh they called me um a few months later um yeah so that's how that's how i got that i had to go out and audition in in los angeles because i can imagine ray charles music yeah that's obviously Mm -hmm. uh, this is my maybe it's a prejudice but I, that's more mature music. So being a young guy, you guess you might want to show off a bit more. But I don't know if that was you or not. But how, did you did you felt that you have to like not you hold know back, something? But... No, because I because I was kind of rooted in um, the groove anyway. Right, you know right, what right. I mean? Like that was that was a time in life when I was like starting to realize that um, oh, that's really important what I do, right, like right, right. Um, playing the bass. People can tell the difference when it feels good, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and and so when I went out there, and I had al- already had, you know, jazz band training right, and right, reading right. and all that kind of stuff, so I knew how to play the bass in a big band. So he, he had a, a full big band, you know. Yeah, yeah. And music was hard. It was not it was not easy. No. Um, and he was a tough, tough boss. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so he, he it was a great first gig because um, when you play for somebody that you know could could kind of uh, <laughs> go off at any time, you know, if something was wrong, mm. you, you're always kind of you're very focused and you're always you know sure. watching them and all that. So um, it was a great it was a great learning gig, great gig to learn on, and we also toured the world, so that was just mind blowing to go to yeah, Europe, yeah, yeah. Japan, and Brazil. And, you know, I was, I was like 20 some years old, maybe 21 years old or something. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, it's also awesome that you had that maturity in your playing, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just thinking about myself at the moment because when I was in my later teens, I guess, all I wanted to do was show off, like, oh, look at what sure. I can do, you know. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I, I don't know if that's a common thing or not, but that's. that's yeah, probably even more now. Um, Back in those days, it was like I, I came up through the 70s, so everything was about like horn section bands and the right, right. funk, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of funk stuff. And, um, you know, especially with bass, I was like listening to Larry Graham and Vreen yeah, yeah, White, sure. and, you know, Jocko and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it was, I was like more into like, how's it going to feel? I, I didn't even, I don't think I even knew that then, but I'm still that way. For me, like making it feel good is is way more, way better to me than... Yeah, you know, exactly. Showing off, so I just was already in that headspace. Yeah. Awesome, man. I mean, that reminds me of something. Um, uh, I spoke to uh, Lee Sklara. You said you know him too. Yeah, I know Lee very well. Yeah. yeah. Well, he, yes. he he was talking about the importance of and the value of being able to play whole and half notes. You know. Yes. What's yeah. your approach? I mean, that goes with what you're saying. I was. Yeah. But what's your approach I'm, to less is more? I guess. Well, you know, basically, I think that the the silence says more than the notes, hmm. or at least, or it has the same weight at least, you know. So, um, it's funny. Ray Charles used to say, um, he said, I, "I know you can play fast and loud, but can you play soft and slow?" <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's hard. I mean, yeah. like, he even Ray Charles was a great teacher in that way because he would take a tempo and he would pull it back even more. And by the time you finish the song, you might have pulled it back even more. So you're talking about a full big band, like 28 people mm. that are watching this one man's movements and his f- body movements and his feet. And you could tell you could tell he would just had this thing that would just like create so much tension that it was, you know, by the time you got to the end of it, it was just like, oh, you know. So, um, you know, I think that a lot of times what you don't say says as much or more than what you do say. Yeah. So I just, and I'm still learning that lesson. You know, it's, it's a, le- a lifetime lesson, I think. Right. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. But having played with all these awesome bands, artists, uh, how has that affected your own writing? Mm hmm. In a big way, you know, um, so many things I learned from everybody that I, that I work with, you know, so not just about, um, my own writing, but also performance and everything else, you know? Um, but, uh, 
I, it's hard to like put my finger on how it's affected me, but yeah, everything right. has affected me all the way from playing classical music, classical music since I was four years old. So there's um, there's a part of me that really loves precision, even though I'm not always a very precise player. I really do like um, playing, you know, playing and recording wise, making it so that I'm making a statement where every every note that I'm playing is making a statement. So if I play a chord on the piano. How much weight does the top note have? Does the middle note, is that really the right now the movement that's in the middle, the big part of it? So maybe the top note can be a little bit less, you know, a little quieter so the other one come out and then come out, you know. Mm -hmm. So as I'm playing, I'm really thinking that way. And I think that also accompanying um, singers, um, instrumentalists, and also being part of a collective group, I've learned a lot because it's conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, Natalie Cole, um, they, every, and everyone's different, but Natalie Cole was somebody, you know, playing piano with her was an incredible learning experience because she wanted to be, she wanted to uh, feel something solid under her, first of all. Secondly, she wanted to be fed. In other words, like some ideas, she wanted, she wanted her piano players to really play, to give her ideas, to send something back. Right, and she right. and also react, you know, Rochelle Farrell, same thing. Um, other players like, say, um, Roberta Flack sometimes just wants you to like, just give me that thing and stay out of my way, you right, know. Right. So um, so they're all different. And, you know, learning how to do all do different um, variants of that and also like give them little surprises, you know. So sometimes on the gigs where it's kind of like. All right, just play that every night. All right, well maybe I'll play a little pass and forth <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. once, you know, because hmm. you're definitely gonna remember that, you know. Yeah. And if you like it, you, you might hire me back. If you don't like it, you might not hire me back. But yeah, you know. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see that. Yeah. Um, but going back to to Larry Graham because he was yeah. a huge influence on me. He still is, uh, especially those albums with um, his own band. What's it called? Uh, uh. The Larry Graham. Yeah, uh, something. Graham Central Station. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Man, those records are awesome, man. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. Killer. Uh, yeah. Did you ever play with him or associated with him at all? Or? I knew him a little bit. I, I never got to play with him, but we did a tour with Graham Central Station. Or it was called like, yeah, it was Larry Graham and um, it was pretty much like Sly Stone Band. Right, uh, right. And um, it was, so we did a tour together. So I saw him every day. And um, I got to, you know, talk to him a lot. And, you know, he signed my bass for me and stuff. Incredible <laughs> gentleman. Really nice guy. Yeah. Um, but to watch him, I was there watching him every night, you know, you know, just to see his, how, how he did what he did. And I still don't know. Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was pretty badass. Uh, yeah. He still is, too, you know. Yeah, 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 <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But, like, you know, talking about, like, the older artists, I guess, like Ray Charles and Larry Graham, for example, or sure. any of those older generation right there always seems to be this uh i don't have a word for it but like they have this amount of experience that really shows when you when you play with them i guess like with mm -hmm. red charles he can control the whole band you know sure. uh the only know what my question is but i always get that feeling of like legendary artists like that is it the, was that something you like felt playing with them that there was this huge Oh yeah, experience behind it, you know. Oh no question. I mean, right. um, I, Maurice White with Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah, yeah. Um, didn't do a lot of live gigs with us. At that point, he was like battling Parkinson's right, disease, right. and um, he would kind of, he would show up every you know for the the, the good ones, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, he would sh when he walked in the room, you could almost feel the band just straighten up. You know, no matter even if we'd been out there without him for a month, as soon as he walked in you realize immediately it was his band, wow. you know, before he even played, before he even sang a note. And, um, his, his demeanor was very calm and peaceful. He was, he wasn't a kind of guy to like yell at people or do this kind of thing. He was very, very peaceful, cool guy. But, um, at the same time, his body movements changed the way the band sounded. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, if you go back and look at that old Earth on the Fire stuff, you see him, it's all about feel and the way he moves and, you know, um, the way he sings, of course. But it's just, well, whereas Philip was different, you know, Philip was uh, the high guy, you know what I mean? And, and the, color, the, the color of the two of their voices 
Um, Philip is an incredible um, lead singer as well. Mm -hmm. But um, it, his thing was really more different than Maurice's. And like you can tell that the band, um, because I've actually been with Maurice when we were putting a tour together. Um, and we had time to, you know, now they don't really have this kind of time to rehearse. But back then, right. we'd spend a whole week with Maurice, just him, and just the rhythm section. Right. So, you know, it'd be me, Sonny Emery, Sheldon, um, no horn players, you know, no vocals, nothing. We just, and Maurice would turn around and face us. He'd be sitting on a chair facing all of us, yeah. just looking at us and moving, you know, just going like, we would play a groove, say it was Shining Star, we play just the groove for 15, 20 minutes, right. nothing else. And you'd see him and he would like, you'd look at his face and you'd see it and I, when it just hit that pocket that was just right, you'd see he, a smile would come on his face, you know, and that's when you knew it was right. But there's no, there's no substitute for just playing, 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 just keep playing that same thing over and over and over again. And then he might look at me and go, um, uh, Mo, can you uh, come up with some horn lines for this part? That kind of thing, you know? And they would be end up being in the show a lot nice. of times, you know. So, but do you think with today's technology that thing has gone away a bit, where where you might not have to practice that much because there might be program stuff with it more than back then? Yeah, I think it's changed a lot, you know, Nicholas. But um, and also budgets have changed, right, so. Right, yeah there's that need to like get it done quickly, you right, know? So right. nobody has time to pay for a month of rehearsal. Right, anymore, right. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> unfortunately, so yeah, I do think it's, it's changed a lot and yeah, there's some, um, those kind of things in technology, I think they help, um, in terms of learning, mm -hmm. you know? So like if I get, um, when I get my materials or if I'm sending out materials, MP3s and charts, mm -hmm. um, say there's a band does use tracks along with it that's cool too um in general as like say keyboard is i'm trying to like play as many parts as i can so right, right. i like it when say if we're playing with tracks if they have the ability to take them out because i'll be okay i got that one i got the bell part okay i got the string line i got the you know mm -hmm. this sometimes you just cannot play at all but in general i, I like trying to I try to give everybody a live experience. So if they like are really looking, they go like, oh, yeah, that guy's actually playing everything. You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's, um, and sometimes that might be like, okay, I go out um, doing piano and Rhodes parts because I don't have time to, to learn everything. Mm. Then, you know, as I go, then I go, okay, maybe take that off, you right, know, right. that kind of thing. Makes sense. Um, mm. But when you, either if you're playing bass or keyboard, If you could describe it, how does it feel when, like, let's take the example where you kept playing the same group group over right. and over. What is that um, moment? I guess you call it moment. What does that feel like when you're actually deep in the in the groove? To you, to me, it feels like um, the groove is playing you, and you're not playing the groove. Right, right. In other words, you're, the absence of thought in terms of like any kind of. Um, absence of ego so you're like it's a team thing mm -hmm. you know we we got the okay we hit the sweet spot everybody let's just stay there and let's enjoy, let's ride on that wave you know um like when something this everybody knows when you've hit it you know what i mean it's like when you when it's hit everybody looks at each other oh ooh, you know it's like even on live gigs uh i love my my particular band because i've got great players like luke smith and uh josh mckenzie And, um, you know, Jamie Michael Harris mm -hmm. and, um, you know, some some great, great players, Michael Brown on guitar. Right. Um, so we're doing uh, when we when we fall into something because because on my gig, it's kind of uh, more like, say, not to compare myself to Miles Davis. I'm not doing that. But it's more in that. I'm more of that kind of like, okay, these are kind of the parameters that we have right. um, for the song. This is the form of it. Right. And let's see what we can make out of it. And then, like, next time, let's see if we can make something completely different out of it. Yeah. So it's like when we hit those moments, um, it's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. You know, so uh, everybody, I, and I think what happens is when you walk off the stage, and you probably, you understand this, and you, we walk off the stage and you're going to, like, look at each other and, and go, uh, wow, that was cool in that song, wasn't it, when we hit that, that one spot, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, man. I mean, even just listening to people if it's in the studio is the same Absolutely. experience, you know. 
Absolutely. And I'm a guy that'll go like um, even um, I, what I love about the live element of things is like I try to surprise people like my percussionist Tuka Milan. Hmm. I'll just be like out of nowhere. Everybody stop. Just let Tuka play. You yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> she had, did not even expect it coming. You know, I might start doing like a little rap on her name on top of that just to like get her to play something else. You know, so I what I try to do is like um, be vulnerable in front of my band so that they can they can feel comfortable being you know vulnerable as well right right yeah that's awesome and what, what does it mean to be vulnerable in front in a situation mm. like that what does that mean to you? i think it's like leaving it on the stage you know when right. people say that you know like literally when you uh, like i sweat when i get off i want to be w drenched with sweat you yeah, know my yeah, own yeah. um i want to say talk to the audience in a way that's kind of like okay we're all part of this experience you know like right um everybody who wants to get on the ride get on you know and it's the party's on the stage if you want to join us come on get in it if not you may want to you know go find another club or something because right, right. This, is, this is what we do and the, the people that i that i have in my band are all those kind of players right, right. singers as well my, my girlfriend kedma is an incredible singer awesome. and um i think we actually probably got together on that that whole premise because we like are both people that love musicians that right. leave it on the stage you know right awesome man but so how how do you because obviously i assume you have nights where it's like ah oh, i don't want to uh, play again how do you how do you still go out there and do it what's your process in, in it's a head? great question nicholas you know basically um you have to have gratitude for being able to do that to do it you know and so there's a, um because there's a lot of people that don't get a chance to go like wow I got my own band. I'm playing 606 Club, you know. Mm -hmm. We play whatever we want, you know. My playing my own music. I got great musicians that, that showed up to play my music, you know. Right, right. And um, you have to you have to always be grateful. And I think that the times that the, there's been so many times that where like I just I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. I do not want to go, you know. Um, those are usually the ones that end up being like the best gigs. Yeah, sometimes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you kind of just have that in the back of your mind that like you know let me just show up and um and see what happens mm -hmm. um a lot of times yeah you know yeah showing yeah. up just showing up is a huge show up. part yeah yep i mean bring your instrument <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you know, all the basics <laughs> yeah yeah exactly right yeah it's, it's a fascinating thing to be honest um but i'd love to talk to you about the business side of of things um because obviously you've been in the business uh for a few decades um how has the, or how important is the business side? Like, let's say you get hired as a hire gun, whatever you want to call it. Um, what are some of the things you want to make sure, you know, business-wise are in place? Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. Um, well, it's it's depending on what the job is, and then I do a lot of things where I'm like partnered with people. I do you know business business type things where I'm actually, yeah, I might be the person. Hiring, you know, that's right, right, right. hiring a whole band for a gig or, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, having to put the whole thing together, pay everybody, you know, get the money up front, you know, this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, it's different. And then you're dealing with different parts of the world, too. Like Japan is a lot different business wise. I've done a lot of business over there. Right. Um, and as well. And I've done a lot of business here in the UK and a lot in the States. Um, as well as like. Then? Well, okay. For example, over here, there's certain things about like um, the time that you're paid, the, the timeliness of your pay right. is really different here um, compared to say like Japan and the United States. Here, you may have to wait a month right. and that's kind of understood, you know, that like, okay, you get the half up front, this kind of thing, or you may not even get half up front. So a lot of time, you know, a lot of these clubs, um, will let you know it's a 30 day thing. And I think that has to do with insurance or something like that, right, you know? Right. So if I'm hiring people, I'm kind of like, I'm on the, um, you know, I'm that point man. So if something, somehow the people that hired me, uh, make a mistake or do something wrong where they're late or something, I've got a whole band or and right. crew or whatever people. So there's that kind of thing. Whereas like say Japan, they would send all your money up front. <laughs> Yeah. and all your airline tickets everything because they right. want to make sure that you show up <laughs> you know what i mean it's, yeah, it's just yeah, a different yeah. way of thinking and it, and in japan there's never even that thing about like well they might rip us off or right. you know in either direction it's kind of okay we shook hands on it 
deals on, right. send them the money. You know, the United States, uh, anything, it's, it could go either way in the United States. Right. But um, I'm learning over here in the UK, there are, there are some different business practices. Even the, the way they pay you um, and the way you invoice and all that kind of stuff is different too. Right. Interesting, man. Mm-hmm. Um, That's just first off the top of my head. But yeah, there, yeah, yeah, there yeah. are more differences. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so go, yeah, let's say uh, uh, you're, you're hired gun. Or let's say you even hire someone to play with you, sure. like you said. Um, what were some of the pitfalls you fell into in the beginning? Let's say when you first got hired as a musician. Sure. Uh, was it stuff you didn't do? Like maybe you didn't put stuff in writing? Or what, what, yep. was, what was it back then? When you started yeah, and, that's, and that was one of them, absolutely. And, and you know, the thing about it is like when to know when to do it and when not to. Um, I ran into a lot of stuff with publishing, songs that I wrote where wow. I got, you know, ripped off and just about every way you could think of like things that, that, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think now it's kind of like, um, musicians still get ripped off, but in, but it's harder to do it because there's some, such a, uh, a trail now, everything is digital. So you can, if say someone tries to steal my song, I can go, well, here I had an MP3 that's stamped from last year. So yeah, 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 I yeah. definitely wrote the song, you know, um, or like, you know, you could go in an email, chain and go like well here it is where you said blah 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 back in you know last year in july so um it's a lot easier now but back then it was it was all like contracts paper stuff um and you know gentlemen's agreements as well so Hmm. um i've been there's a lot of things like like there's songs out there that i got no credit for there's um things i played on that i didn't get credit for or didn't get paid for um could you give examples you want to leave that I, I'll leave it. Right, <laughs> I'll leave right, it right. Now. I mean, like some things I, I did actually get, um, you know, well, I'll give you one. One is one is um, Michael Jackson. This is it. Right. So that was a strange situation um, where we were like being filmed every day. Mm. And part of our contract to do the tour was to allow them to film us every day so that right. Michael could have dailies in check out what you know we were doing songs in different keys and uh and whatever and so he could kind of decide what he wanted to do um and then he died right. which is we all know that story and it's horrible yeah. yeah um and there was you know on top of that it was a little bit really strange about the way he did die and so therefore investigations and all this kind of stuff and we kind of got lost in all that and, and the next thing we knew it uh this is it the movie came out and um not only had we lost a gig, unfortunately, but we also were not compensated for the movie. So right. that is that's one that I wish I could have like kind of foreseen, you know, but how could you foresee that yeah, Michael exactly. Jackson would have died, you know? So yeah. um and it, it was a you know, it's a tough one because sometimes it'll be a, a major company that's hiring you and you're you can't really buck the system as we say because you may need them again further down right. the road. But do you do you always ask for a deposit of fifty percent, let's say, before every gig you do, or that also depends? In general, yeah. I mean, there's there's everything you have to take, as we say, with a grain of salt. So right. some people you have great relationships with all the time. You already know that they're gonna they've always paid you on time and this kind of thing. Um, no problem. You know, make sure that you know. But I would say, in general, um, one business thing is make sure at least you have an email or something right. that has the terms of your agreement. And you may not need a contract, but have an email at least. Right. And what are some of the things you you have a right as as a musician, for example? Like, if you can give an example of what an email can look like, like what you can not demand, but you know, put in right. Yeah, I mean, you know, depending on what it is, um, get detailed. Like, you know, if you're if say it's um, some private function um, that I'm in charge of, um, hiring a band and all this, I want to know. What time of sound check? Um, what, are the, what all the course backline requirements and everything? Every, all the all the people in the band get exactly what they need as far as their instruments and amps and drums and all that kind of stuff. What time do we eat? What do we have to eat? You know, you got to feed the band because we're there all day. Um, so there's got to be some kind of um, you know compensation for that. When certainly, as I said, um, money up front. When do we get the rest of it? This kind of thing. Um, so just about anything that you could think of, dressing rooms, right. you know, like I go to, go to gigs sometimes, you know, if you don't if you don't think of it, believe me, it will come up, you know right, what I mean? Right. And you got a whole band explain, well, 
sorry, you guys, can you dress in the bathroom? You know what I mean? So there's, uh, even when you do have it in writing, you know there's going to be something that you're going to get to the gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, you're going to have to say it, talk to somebody about it that, that didn't happen. I'd say nine times out of ten. Yeah. But <laughs> you can pull up an email and say, it says right here, you guys are supposed to provide us with a meal, you know? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's a good advice, man. Um, yeah, yeah. Even what currency, like say you're playing a gig in Italy, are you getting right. euros? Are you getting right, right. pounds? Are you going to lose money when you finally change it over to pounds? You know, like mm-hmm. uh, um, def- all those kind of travel arrangements, that's a big one. Because sometimes, let's say, um, even over here, if I do something in Europe and I'm flying Ryanair or uh, EasyJet or something like that, they have restrictions about whether you can bring your... Um, sure. Your it's base yeah, yeah. On, on board. Or, so, or if you can, it's going to cost another 100 pounds to do it. So make sure you get that money up front. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, that's good advice, man. Um, I, I, I don't want to talk exactly about the Michael Jackson ex- experience because you've talked about that a lot. But um, something, you know, like everyone experiences in this industry is obviously highs and lows and it's sure. just like waves and... I understood it with the Michael thing. This is it. It got canceled. You you lost yeah. a big chunk of touring uh, gigs. Yes. And then did you, um, was were you supposed to play with Christina Aguilera afterwards and that also got canceled? Or? Yes, absolutely. Exactly. So, yeah. So, uh, I yeah. mean, that's obviously, if if that was my experience, I'd be like, shit, this is, seems like the world is against me or something. But how do you? How do you still? I'm telling you, Nicholas, that was only <laughs> two of the things that happened within that right, year. Right, there were about right. four that were all devastating, you know. Shit. Um, but yeah, so your question is, how do how do I? Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe if, if you don't mind telling us what the other two things were, if you want to. Yeah, well, I there was a deal I did with uh, Japan and Korea, which was actually a Michael Jackson um, uh, tribute, where I bought right. a full band over full production and. Um, um, the business got screwy at the end, and um, and there was another thing where I was supposed to be going to Japan with a with my own band called Native Son, right? Um, and literally, it was like two days before something something happened. I can't remember what it was, mm. but it was just it was just one of those years where like nothing would stick, you know. Um, right. So um, and and the highs and lows that come with that are just crazy because, you know, you, when I got Christina's gig, that was just like. A little bit of a, a yeah, relief, yeah. you know, um, and then you know she canceled that tour. We did a lot of television shows, but um, right. no tour. So uh, and and you know, and it was for a while. It was looking as if we might be even compensated for the fact that the tour right. was canceled, but we weren't. Right. But so, how do you deal with that emotional mm-hmm. high and lows? I guess you can call it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, you know, it's hard. It's just hard. You know, I had people that supported me, you know, I have people that, that love me, that, that were there for me, you know, friends and um, family. And uh, that's a big part of it. And I think I just have that kind of drive. It's like it's not over till it's over. So, you know, once I kind of wipe my eyes and, you know, dust my knees off, it's like, OK, what's next? You know, and I've also been really trying to be um, – so th- those gigs are like sidemen or, you know, hired gun type gigs. I have been trying to be the, the person that's hot doing the hiring. Right. So I've always been like trying to do business deals, um, apps for, um, I've, I've developed some apps. Cool. I've got um, master classes. I've, I've been really trying to take it on to like, what can I do personally? I've got my own label called Water Sign. Um, I do a lot of charity work and that kind of stuff. So... The whole time I was thinking about it as, yeah, I, I love touring and I love, you know, playing with big artists and um, all that stuff. But it, I have to develop my own thing, you know, whatever that is. It may not even be music. Yeah. Um, I'm work, working on my own book right now as well. Oh, cool. So, yeah, so an autobiography. So um, it's just, I just, I don't know. I just always have been able to, to get up. But it's, it's extremely hard. I'm not always, you know, um, so positive. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I, I mean, try. I, I, I totally get it, man. I mean, even though I'm I'm fairly young in the industry, I experience that as well and yeah. ups, ups and downs, and it can be hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look what we're in right now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's like whoa. What, so, like, actually, I mean, you know, 
there's been a lot of developments that I thought never even thought of, like online concerts, sure. you know, and um, the, you know the the advent of Zoom and all these kind of things, and um, you know, internet getting better and better and faster and all that. Mm-hmm. So we've we've all like managed to adapt, just what we're doing right now, even. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, we're going, well, geez, um, <laughs> when's the next time we're going to be like really playing a live gig it yeah. might be next year? You know, we don't even know yet. You know? Yeah, no, it's a bit crazy, man. Uh, yeah. Keep hearing different uh, stuff. But yeah I, don't, yeah, I don't know, to be honest, when live gigs will be back. It's hard uh, to say. Yeah. I mean, some have started already. And, you know, in the um, States, even um, I'm not saying it's best thing. Because right. Uh, because right now there's a resurgence and all this. Right, right. Over here, there are some things. There's some things I'm hearing about that are happening that are like socially distanced and you know um, outside and that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, so you know, hopefully. it just seems hard for uh, promoters to want to do shows if you have to have two one meters apart people because then oh. you sell way less tickets <laughs> i guess totally yeah <laughs> i don't even know how they're staying in business i don't yeah. know how pubs are staying in business you that know? too it's it's uh but they are i mean you know some are some aren't um but at the same time it was you know um i think that they kind of um may have some of them may have a little bit even more respect for musicians at this point because they realize what we're going through and they realize that they actually need yeah. need music yeah exactly place, you know <laughs> So uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, know? yeah. I hope it's going to be okay, man. Uh, yeah. for everyone. Absolutely, me too. Um, but having been in the industry for so long as you have, what do you think it takes to be able to sustain a career in music? Because obviously, you've seen changes happening. You've seen maybe yeah. going bad, going good. What's your take on that? I think we have to we have to band together. I think the strength lies in us coming together. On whatever that is, you know, I mean, when you're when you're by yourself and you're kind of going like, well, how am I going to finish my album or something like that? It's always okay. well, who's going to do the artwork and how am I going to get somebody to do PR for this? And I need a social media person. And, you know, so I've always been um, like really down with the barter system. So, you know, I'd say like, Nicholas, can you play bass on my album and I'll play keyboards on yours? You know, this kind of thing. Uh, somebody that does video, maybe do me a favor on that, and I can do uh, I can do the music for some kind of ad that they're doing for somebody else, and this kind of thing. I think sure. a lot of it has to do with that, you know, or even as far as like the social injustices and things in the world right now. I think we have a very a huge voice, and people listen to us. So through our music, I really do believe um, we can change things. You know, I, I believe music can stop a war. I've always thought that. It's it's like one of the most powerful things on earth. Yeah, yeah. definitely, man. Mm. Uh, yeah, and that, that's a very good point to to, and a very good idea to trade skills, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I've I've been doing it since two thousand one, and it was just because I had to, you know. Right, right, right. Um, interestingly enough, I'm getting ready to um, put out a project called We Are One. It's going to be a video, and cool. it features uh, some greats, you know, Michael McDonald, and Josh Stone. And, cool. Um, you know, Alita Adams and all this. And it's been something that, crazy enough, I started back in 2001 not knowing that the perfect time for the song is now. Because mm. um, it's We Are One, it's, you know, it's about unity and it's kind of a, a children's song in a certain way. So there's nothing, uh, how do I say it? It's, it's like Disney correct, you know what I mean? It's not going to, it shouldn't offend anybody really. Um, right, right, but right. at the same time, it talks about how we need to come together. Right. And I've got some, you know, big stars on there now. Um, Peter Andre as mm. well. Um, right, right, right. Yeah. So like, um, I'm really, I'm excited about it because we're, we're about to release it and you're know, probably within a month. Cool. And, um, really yeah, but that that's one. exactly what I'm talking about. I couldn't have done it without, you know, those people and all the musicians that helped me make it. I, have not paid anybody a cent. <laughs> right, right, right. I yeah. just have not been able to do it. Yeah. I hope I, I'll be able to do it, but I just did it by by talking to all of them and, and letting them know what I was you know, trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, I actually did uh, not on the scale as you did, but uh, there was also some week ago I was just like, you know, I want to do something uh, slow. And it's like, hey, who wants to come on this lockdown jam? And a few people... Nice joined on the song to be honest that was pretty cool <laughs> yeah yeah it's like so um we're so giving musicians are the 
I have to say, I'm so proud of musicians because they're so giving and they're so um, on they, the, the thing that's put in us about the show must go on. Mm. You know, we're so reliable. Yeah, yeah, you know, for sure, man. Some of the things that people I've had to do and other people I know have to do just to get to a gig to to you know show up and play it and all that, and they may not make anything. You know. Um, I think we get a bad name about being like, you know, whatever, late and lazy and all this right, kind of stuff. Right, it's right. so the opposite. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Wanting money all the time. Most musicians I know um, want to eat and want to have, you know, certainly get paid what they're worth, mm-hmm. you know, when they can. But in general, we're such giving creatures. Yeah, you know? totally, man. Like, yeah, there's nothing that's going to stop you from, you know, going to work, you know, if there's a gig right. booked or whatever, you know, you're going to get there, you know. Um, awesome man I mean just looking again back at your career is there any moments that stand out as you know like shit I can't believe I'm doing this or I'm playing with that do you have any favorite moments like that oh yeah Nicholas like a lot (laughs) lot of I still have them all the time you know I mean one example of me is um, in the classical world like every now and then I'll do um piece with the orchestra full orchestra and i'm playing the piano you know Mm -hmm. and every time i'm saying to myself like what am i who am i trying to kid i'm not a you know classical pianist really but um i've played rhapsody in blue by gershwin several times um with orchestras all over the world actually i just did it um maybe four four or five months ago up in manchester with um royal uh, northern college of music which is excellent school wow incredible and um and you know so it's like it's a little bit like walking a tightrope because there's you can't you know first of all you can't stop or screw up and then say hey you know look at another keyboard player and go like what are you playing or something <laughs> look. there's nobody to blame but yourself and um talk about a train wreck if you mess up right, there's right, right. no getting out of it you can't say let's start can we start that one over again there's so no one I, who can sing you the melody, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You see, I can find a road manager. <laughs> yeah, but um, no, it's so it's it's really it, uh, I'm a nervous. I'm I have a bit of stage fright anyway, believe right. it or not. But um, so it, it, it's my way of kind of like making myself walk that tightrope because the exhilaration you feel when you actually get to the other side is amazing. Mm-hmm. So um, that's that's the first thing that comes to me. Awesome, man. Uh, I mean, looking at the other side of the coin, is there any moments where you thought, shit, is this something I can keep doing? Do that I can know? keep doing? Yeah, is, is this something I can actually keep doing? This is too hard. Yeah, I would say that because now I've done it with about ten, you know eight, nine orchestras and also right. do a piano and stuff. So like after the first one, you know, it's like adrenaline junkie stuff. You know what I mean? You're like, ooh, I got to have that again. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. right. Um, and, you know, you got to practice for months to get to, to get to the level of playing it and all that. Um, so I would say that, you know, I, every, in, I played it, what, four months ago. I'll probably find a place to play it next year, you nice. know, and I want to see how far I can go with it. Maybe I can I can do it in um, Russia or, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. some other. I've been asked to, to play it a few places now. Um, so we'll see. Awesome, man. Mm-hmm. Well, it's always been a pleasure. Um, maybe before we wrap up, you can let the listeners know where they can find uh, more info about you, hire you, check your music. Yeah. All that sort of good uh, stuff. Yeah, well, I'm at, um, right now, my, my, my website's getting a redo, so it's morrispleasure.com. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, I'm on Instagram at morrispleasure, and um, also on Facebook at morrispleasure without the E on it. Right, right, so, right. Yeah. So that right now, I'd say Instagram and Facebook are the best places to find me right now. And I've got I'll have some new music very soon. I'm about to put out an album awesome. called Mo Elements of Pleasure. Um, you just had a record yeah. called because you you uh, you had a record in the early 2000s that was called something similar, right? Elements of Pleasure. Oh, and this one is uh, called Mo Elements of Pleasure. Ah, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Exactly. Is it in similar vibe as the other one? or Very much similar vibe. It's like a lot of, uh, you know, funk soul kind of thing. And some surprises and a lot of great guest stars. Um, Philip Bailey, um, the great Ollie Woodson from The Temptation, who is now passed, passed on. Right, right. Um, um, Treat Her Like a Lady. Uh, we've got uh, Roberta Flack on, a, on cool. one of my songs. And it's the same kind of thing. That's why I kind of named it similarly, you know. Right. Awesome, yeah. man. But yeah, you're going to promote that on social media, I guess, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. 
Yeah. This is people for people. that by the far, I would say, you know. Awesome, yeah. man. We are, I'll leave links to the social media stuff below. So oh, great. Can click it. But yeah, thanks again, Mo, for taking great. your time. That was a Oh, my pleasure, pleasure. Nicholas. Thank you. Good awesome. to see you again. You too, man. Thank you, Mo, for coming on. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Before you leave, please subscribe to the show, the podcast, whether that's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or here on YouTube. I'd love to see you joining the community, whatever you want to call it. So just hit the subscribe button and you have joined. And again, don't forget to join the audio tribe. Link is in the description below. And feel free to leave comments about the interview in the comments as well. If you have any questions or if you just love the music, any of the music Mo has been a part of and all that sort of things. It was a pleasure seeing you this week again. I will see you next week. So take care and see you soon.